I think what I want to do this morning is try to finish up looking at the Roman Catholic Bible, the Reims Douay Bible. Let's, um, I think I can do this probably all in one morning, although I'm going to try to draw together some other notes. I want to get through with this. I think this is our fourth study, and that's really all that I had planned to do was about a month's worth of teaching on the Reims Douay. Uh, but let's start looking at the printings and editions of the Reims Douay, which really brings us into <coughs> a Chaloner revision, which is what we want to look at this morning. Now remember that although the Old Testament was actually completed first, and it was um, published when the college moved back to Douay, and hence its official name is the Douay Old Testament, the New Testament was printed first. The New Testament was completed after the Old as far as translation, but it actually was printed first while the college was in that in-between stage at Reims. It was at Douay, it was at Reims, it was at Douay. The New Testament was published in 1582. The Old Testament was held back for lack of funds because of some of the local political changes. And a third reason the Old Testament was he held back in its um, printing was because a few new editions of the Vulgate had recently come out. And the editors wanted to wait until these editions had been consulted before they published the Old Testament. So... While the, the New Testament's been published or printed in 1582 and we're waiting for the Old Testament, before the Old actually comes out for the first time, the New Testament actually is republished for the, again, or, or republished for the first time, it comes out published for the second time in 1600. In 1600, and then it's followed by the Old Testament the years 1609 and 1610. <clears throat> now the KJV came out in 1611. All of this is English work. The KJV is a Protestant work, and the RD, the Reims Douay, is a Catholic work. So that would raise an immediate question. Was the KJV influenced at all by the Reims Douay Bible? They're all coming out in the same ballpark, especially the Old Testament of the Reims Douay, the Douay Old Testament, since it's published one or two years prior to the publication of the KJV. So did it have any bearing on the KJV? Well, uh, for the New Testament, I think we would have to say definitely yes. The Old Testament probably came out a little bit too late only coming out as much as a year before the KJV. And remember, this is not done in England. It's done by English scholars who have been transplanted down into northern France. So I don't think that we're going to find much influence as far as the Old Testament is concerned. But I think that we'll end up seeing a large number of Reims Douay phrases, that is, especially Reims New Testament phrases, in the KJV New Testament. Because the KJV committees, and there were three of those, that worked at Oxford, Westminster, and Cambridge, did uh, look over very thoroughly various other Bible translations which had come out earlier, including Roman Catholic ones. So since the New Testament of the R.D. came out in 1582, well, you've got three decades, 30 years for it to be in existence and for the KJV translators to begin looking at it. Now, of course, I don't intend to imply by that that the KJV work actually began as early as 1582. Uh, the committees were really formalized in 1604. An official um, work by the delegation sent uh, didn't start until 1607, and then it was completed in 1611 in a very short period of time. But at least from the year 1604 or 1607, to be even more precise, until 1611, they could have at their disposal the Reims New Testament, since it had been in publication now for several decades. So yes, if, if you ever have wondered, or if you, um, others have asked you, well, since they come out around the same time, I wonder if this Catholic Bible influenced the Protestant Bible of Bibles, the KJV. Yes, in fact, it did. Uh, gladly, we might add, it didn't influence in areas like Hebrews 1-3 or superstantial bread or all of those things that would give us problems. Gladly, they had more sense then to allow the, the Reims New Testament to influence them there. 
But yes, just in phrases and the way certain things were translated, uh, I think we could make a, a point by point case and study, which I don't intend to do, of how the Rames Douay Bible, particularly the Rames New Testament, has influenced the KJV. So the Old Testament, we haven't said much about it because it finally comes out now in 1609 and 1610. What type of translation was it? How does it compare with the Rames New Testament part? Well, they're very similar. I think the Old Testament has the same problems that the New Testament has. It's based on the Vulgate. It's too literally translated from the Vulgate. It has the old ecclesiastical terms that are retained. It has the inexplicable Latinisms that are found and so forth. The polemical notes, however, were not as numerous for the Old Testament as for the New. And you slow me down if I'm going too fast. It seems like I'm going fast this morning. You're just kind of staring at me. That's how I can tell I must be going fast. I had a lot to say. Maybe I need to just uh, start all over again. We're on the polemical notes. We don't have as many, and they're not as, as polemical in the Old Testament as for the New. They are supplied by Thomas Worthington. They are supplied by Thomas Worthington. The Vulgate edition used for the Rames Douay, I don't even think I've given you that before. The Vulgate edition that was used was the 1547, and you'll have all of this earlier in your Vulgate notes, was at least, you know, what the versions were and some characteristics of them, was the 1547 Hentenius edition of Louvain. H-E-N T-E-N-I-U-S, the Hittenius, Hittenius edition of 1547. But the translators of the Rames Douay brought this up to date with the more recently published Sixto Clementine edition of the Vulgate that came out in 1592. Now, see, that would specifically refer to the Old because the New Testament has already come out ten years earlier. Remember the Sixto Clementine? We later studied the Wordsworth White edition, and that became the definitive Vulgate edition forevermore after that. Sixto Clementine and then Wordsworth and White. So they've used two, in other words. They use the Vulgate edition of Hittenius of 1547 for the entire Bible. And then when the Sixto Clementine edition of the Vulgate comes out in 1592, then they use it for the Old Testament. It can't be used for the New since it's too late. So the New Testament is published in 1582, as I've already given you. First revision comes out in 1600, which I've already given you. The next edition comes out in 1621. These are revisions republications. Uh, the fourth one in 1633. And the fifth one over a hundred years later in 1738. The Old Testament comes out 1609-10. It's republished for the first time in 1635. And it does not go through as many editions as does the New. Now, some of you from your Catholic backgrounds might happen even have uh, what you thought was a Rames Douay Bible. And if you've checked in yet, you might have found that it does not even resemble some of the points and um, things that I've been describing. You can look up superstantial bread and and you won't find it. You'll find daily bread. You can look up a lot of those things and you won't find it. So then what we want to really discuss in conclusion is why. Well, it's because you've got a different Bible. As I've said before, there's no such thing anymore today as the Rames Douay Bible. Just like there's no such thing anymore as the original 1611 KJV. It's, it's been highly modernized as the years have gone by. All modern editions of the Douay Bible, and remember it's called Douay if you want just one name, it's D the Douay Bible. All modern editions are based on a major, major 
uh, revised edition done in the middle of the 18th century, 1749-1750, one for the Old Testament, one for the New. We'll get into that more specifically here in a moment. And it was done by uh, the man Richard Chaloner, C-H-A-L-L-O-N-E-R. And so technically speaking, we don't have a Rames Douay Reims Douay or a Douay Rames, sometimes it's called that, or a just Douay Bible. We have a Chaloner Bible. Uh, Richard came along and completely, completely revised and edited the earlier Reigns do a work. And it's already gone through several revisions and editions as I've just given you for the New Testament from 1582 up to 1738 and one or perhaps another for the Old Testament. So like I have a Bible right here that's called a, a Douay Confraternity. And this goes back several years. And the, con the Douay is the Old Testament, the Confraternity is the New. And like I have in my study just a Confraternity New Testament. The Confraternity New Testament is something entirely different. Uh, now they've been joined together. Oh, this is many years old right here. Back in the 40s or 50s, I believe, is when this was joined together. And, uh, and we'll, discuss, uh, we'll discuss the uh, Confraternity New Testament itself later. We're going to discuss some of the important uh, 20th century Roman Catholic translations, but we're not going to do that now. We'll wait until we get up into the 20th century. So let's say some things about this man, Richard Chaloner, first of all, because he is so important now as far as the Reims Douay Bible is concerned. He lived from 1691 to 1781. He lived to be very old. But that means what? That he lived about 100 as well as about 200 years after the publication of the Reims New Testament. Now, if someone lived 100 as well as 200 years after something, that means they lived to be about 100. Well, he lived to be 90, as you can see. He was born to Protestant Presbyterian parents. And yet his name goes down in Catholic history as providing us this Bible. There's no Reims Douay anymore because it has been so thoroughly revised that you'd never go back to the original Reims Douay. You would only go, go so far as back to the work of Richard Chaloner. Well, you say he's born to Protestant Presbyterian parents. How did he ever get mixed up with... Um, the papal system in Rome. Well, after the death of his father, who was a Presbyterian, obviously, he was sent to live with some other local people. I'm not, I'm not exactly for sure uh, where his mother is at this time. Maybe she died when he was young or something. But I do know that after the death of his father, he was sent to live with <coughs> some other people. And these other people were Roman Catholics. And so we could say through them he was, quote, converted to Roman Catholicism at the age of 13. In other words, his father died when he was around 12 or 13, and he's sent to live with some Roman Catholics. Now, at the age of 14, they sent him away to study. Now, of course, he's an Englishman. He's born an English boy. He's born in England. They sent him away to study. Where do you think they sent him away to study? to Douay, the College of Douay, Reims Douay College. Of all places, so we're right back to Douay again. Of all, and because that's where English um, Catholic scholars were to be trained. So of all places, at the age of 14, this is many, many years now, over 100 years after the founding of the Reims Douay, the, the Douay and the Reims and the Douay College, he is sent as a 14-year-old boy to study uh, theology, Roman Catholic polemics and dogma, the College of Douay. He stays here for 25 years before he returns to England. First as a student, then as a professor, and then as the vice president of the college. He did not return to England until the year 1730 when he was 39 years old. does not return to England until 1730 when he is 39 years old. That means he stays away from home for a quarter of a century. Now we won't get into too much of his biography since we're really studying the Reims Douay Bible and his revision of it, but I'll just mention one tidbit of information about him in case any of you who came out of the Catholic Church have heard this. He is probably most famous, well most famous for his revision of this Bible, but secondly He's famous for a very popular Roman Catholic devotional work that's read up into modern times 
called Garden of the Soul. I don't know if you've ever heard of that or read that, but it has been a very popular Roman Catholic devotional book, especially in England. But since it's in England, it would also be read by Roman Catholics in the United States. And you can still find, I think, old copies of that. Garden of the Soul, a very popular Roman Catholic devotional book. Later in his life, he became, when he comes back to England, he comes back to stay, of course, after a 25-year student professor, VP tenure at Douai, France. And when he comes back, he becomes eventually the Roman Catholic Bishop of London. So he's no small fish, as they would say. Now, he himself published five revisions of the New Testament, the Rheims New Testament. And all of these were based upon that 1738, the last one that I gave you, that 1738 revision by an earlier scholar of the Rheims New Testament. So he publishes five, and I'll give you the years for that. He publishes five revisions of the Rheims New Testament. 1749, 1750, 52, 53, and 72. And two editions of the Douay Old Testament. 1750 and 1763. Now here's what's important to remember with all those dates. The first of both of those, 1749 for the new, that was the first one I gave you there, 1750 for the old. The first of both of these, 1749 50, became the basis for all future Rames Douay Bibles and may now really properly be called the RDC, the Reims Douay Chiloner Bible. Completely revised. The first one of each of these, 1749 for the new, 1750 for the old. So those are the dates to remember. 1582 for the Reims New Testament, 1609 to 10 for the Douay Old Testament, and 1749 and 50 for the Reims Douay Chiloner Bible complete. Three names, two hyphens, separating Reims, Douay, Douay, Shalom. Nothing short of an entirely new translation, because, of course, very few people could understand the Reims, Douay, English in England, and we've looked at some of those references before. Now, for instance, if I open up my Bible here, it's called the Holy Bible, translated from the Latin Vulgate with annotations. See, Catholics don't do that anymore, so this takes us back several years. With annotations, references, and an historical and chronological table. The Douay version, and they happen to spell it D-O-U-A-Y, as you'll see it probably all the time in the Bible because that's the old spelling. Now we modernize it with an I instead of a Y. The Douay version of the Old Testament, first published by the English College at Douay, A.D. 1609. But then, of course, it's been revised through the years. The Confraternity Edition of the New Testament, a revision of the Chelona Reigns version edited by Catholic scholars under the patronage of the Episcopal Committee of the Confraternity of Christian Doctrine. Now, just who these men were and what that's all about, well, we'll be studying that in a separate work because that was done in this century, the Confraternity New Testament. So what you have here is kind of a confusing, you know, arrangement of affairs. You've got the Old Testament, the, the Douay Old Testament translated first, but then they have a lack of funds, and the New Testament actually is published first. And then it actually is, is revised before the Old Testament comes out for the first time in 1609. And then both of them go through a series of several revisions of the, over the next few years so that we don't have the original Reims Douay anymore. Then Shaloner comes on the scene, and in 1749 and 1750 just makes a completely entirely new work. And so now we have a Douay Reims, a Reims Douay Chiloner work. Now we have three names involved in this. And then toward the, at the beginning of this century, we have a confraternity Roman Catholic New Testament done by this um, group of Catholic scholars. And so they take the, and the confraternity kind of is a revision of the Chiloner Reims New Testament. 
And so then that's because it's not an old, the confraternity is just new. And so then that is attached to the Reims Douai Bible, no longer called Reims, because it's not really Reims, it's gone through Chaloner, and it's not really Chaloner, now it's confraternity. And so it becomes a confraternity New Testament. And yet for the old, although the old has gone through all of these revisions, it's gone through Chaloner, it did not go through confraternity because that was just for the New Testament uh, section of it. They keep the Douay name to keep the original name to put us back into uh, 15th and, or 16th and 17th century England. So see, that's why it becomes confusing. That's why on the outside you see Douay confraternity. And, you know, it becomes very confusing. Why not Douay Reigns or why not Douay Reigns Chaloner confraternity? Well, I guess you could think of many different names to name this, but this is what they have chosen to name it. Mine is an old copy that, you know, belonged to someone else. Uh, and uh, I, I was just flipping through it here this morning, and uh, I find it, found it very interesting. I can't find anything. Oh, there's something else underlined. Before, well, before I found that, the only thing I could find underlined was in John 3, Verse 3, Jesus answered by whoever owned this before me, it's a used book, and said to him, Amen, Amen, I say to thee, unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It's almost like an evangelical Catholic must have had this, because a Catholic would never be familiar with a verse like that. You know, you are saved whenever you're baptized and, and you partake of the Mass. And then they've got verse 7 underlined, you know, really strongly with a black magic marker, you must be born again. <laughs> and then they have John 3.16 underlined as well. And John 3.36, that tells you something about who owned this Bible. That's not a typical Catholic underlining things like that. He would have found some passage about the Eucharist to underline. <laughs> now, something else I just want to tell you about this Bible before we go on. I've told you about, because some of you don't come from a Catholic background, and, and that leaves you a little confused what we're talking about when we talk about Roman Catholic dogma. And we've talked about indulgences before. That's what really started the whole Reformation. Martin Luther was upset with Tetzel and his selling indulgences just across the river from the parish of the Roman Catholic priest, Martin Luther. Well, this Bible even has, and you find this in a lot of Catholic works, here on the, the inside of the front page, it says, an indulgence of 300 days. And that shortens your time in purgatory. An indulgence of 300 days is granted to all the faithful who read the Holy Scriptures at least a quarter of an hour. So they can guarantee you a year short in purgatory for 15 minutes of time reading. And I guess if you just keep reading 15 minutes and 15 minutes and 15 minutes, you know, do your 15 minutes a day reading, you have a year cut off, almost a year in purgatory for every day that you spend reading. But we know it just doesn't work exactly like that. <laughs> to begin with, there's no such thing as purgatory. And if there was... You certainly couldn't shorten your time there by reading the Bible. The best thing to do is not sin, and that would shorten your time there. You wouldn't go there if you didn't sin. Okay, let's go back then. So this is really not, you just don't find Reigns Douay. You have an old Douay confraternity now. That's not the same. You can, for instance, I'll give you for instance. Now, you're going to find nothing the same in the New, because not only is this not Reigns New Testament, this is not Shalomer New Testament either. This is confraternity New Testament. So let's just see what some of these scriptures have that, that we've um, made fun of before, like Matthew, Matthew 6 and verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. That's, that's their translation. Now they have a reference here because this has annotations and notes in it. Daily, found in some codices of the Vulgate for superstantial, and the Greek original of this word is translated daily in Luke 11 and verse 3. So you can go through here and you won't find some of those odd references and strange words that I've talked about. And the reason why is the reason why Chaloner revised the Bible in the first place because people couldn't understand it. And so um, he excised a lot of those difficult words. You say, well, since this is... Uh, something else underlined in Proverbs. Since this is um, a confraternity new and it's still do a old, couldn't we find things that are weird, like we read of those strange sayings last time in the Old. Uh, most notable of those examples would be Isaiah 5 and verse 1. Well, no, not really, because it also has gone through revision. I will sing to my beloved the canticle, and the Catholics love that term canticle for songs. The Song of Solomon is called canticles for them. It comes from the Latin, and that's why they like that term canticle. 
<coughs> we Protestants don't even know what they're talking about. I remember when I first saw that, I didn't even know what they're talking about. Canticle, the book of Canticles, I thought, is that another apocryphal work or pseudepigraphal work? And lo and behold, it's a song of Solomon. I will sing to my beloved the canticle of my cousin concerning the vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a hill in a fruitful place. Remember the horn and the sons of oil here? Well, they've got it right. It's the same as the KJV. My beloved had a vineyard on a hill in a fruitful place. But here is their note down here. On a hill, literally in the horn, the son of oil. Because that's what you'll find back in the original Douay Bible. So they threw some of those things down into the notes at the bottom. So we're not talking now about this. This is just to show you what you can find today. But this is still not the official range do it's still not the Chelona Bible because it's a confraternity New Testament attached to it so forget that for a moment let's go back to the year 1749 and 1750 and talk about the Chelona Bible some things remain the same in it when we compare it with the range do for instance Jesus and the John the Baptist still went and preached the message do penance for the kingdom of heaven is at hand now you won't find that here in confraternity it's repent here so don't confuse it with this we're back to Chalonu which is really the one we want to discuss this morning Jesus and John that would be Matthew chapter 3 and chapter 14 John and Jesus in chronological order there go and preach do penance or penance rather excuse me do penance for the kingdom of heaven is at hand give us this day our superstantial bread Chalona keeps the same translation there. The Paraskeve of the Pasch is still the same. I just gave you part of this last time. That stays the same. Now he's supposed to be revising this so that English Roman Catholics can understand it. But there were some things that he failed to do. He left penance, he left superstantial bread. Those for, of course, polemical reasons. There's no polemical reason here, just an, uh, an odd way of rendering the Paris Eve of the past is the Passover Eve in John 19.14. That's the Eve of Passover. I guess you can kind of see it there, but you'd still never get it, though. That is Passover Eve in John 19.14. So those are some of the odd <coughs> renderings that we looked at last time that stay the same in Chaloner's Bible. Other things, however, he changed. Do you remember what ex and anointed mean? What it meant originally for them? Ex and anointed? That was the emptied himself in Philippians 2. Well, Chaloner gives it to us as he emptied himself instead of he ex and anointed himself. So he changes ex and anointed. He changes ex and anointed to emptied himself. Uh, the azimes. A Z Y M E S. Azimes remains just that, Azimes, in Acts 12.3. But it's changed to unleavened bread in two other scriptures. I don't know why it shows his inconsistency, though. It stays this strange word here in Acts 12.3, but it's changed to unleavened bread in Mark 14.12 and Luke 22.1. Skinopagia. Do you remember what that was? That was Tabernacles. Skinopagia becomes Tabernacles, Feast of Tabernacles, in John 7, 2. So thankfully that word has now been deleted. Skinopagia changed to Feast of Tabernacles in John 7, 2. And I'm sure Rhoda would be happy for this. Rhoda's no longer a witch. She's back to a damsel in Acts 12. I'm sure she's grateful for that. It had been damsel earlier. The Protestants have generally translated that as damsel. But remember the Rames Due, the Rames New Testament gave her as a winch, W-E-N-C-H-E. So Rhoda has gone from a winch back to a damsel. 
Now, in a strange twist of events, let me see if you can follow this for me. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you a timeline. I talked the other night about thinking according to a timeline. So I'll write according to one here. I'll show you a very interesting twist of events here. 1582. We have R-N-T, the Reigns New Testament. Sixteen oh nine, sixteen ten. We have the Douay Old Testament. Sixteen eleven. We have the KJV. Then way over here, seventeen forty nine to fifty. We have Rames, Douay, Shalona. Now this, this of course, was done by the Protestants. 1611. Was it influenced any by the Douay Old Testament? No, because it came out too close to the publication of the KJV. They had already been doing their work for the last few years. And now just because this Bible, the Old Testament of the Catholic Bible, comes out, now that the Catholic Bible is completed, they don't have time to jump into it and out and redo all the work that they've spent several years doing. So no, that doesn't influence it. However, they do have this, and so, yes, the Catholic Bible does influence the KJV. Okay, now let's go over here to this man, Shaloner. He was a Protestant by birth, right? A Presbyterian. I wonder what Bible he was brought up on as a child then. The KJV. So when he converts to Catholicism, becomes a Roman Catholic scholar and professor, and then actually revises his work, what does he have flowing in the back of his mind, though, as a little boy? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to... He's got the KJV flowing in the back of his mind. So in a strange twist of events, you almost have to draw this line to get it down. The Reigns Douay New Testament, the Reigns New Testament influences the KJV, which influences Chaloner, which translates or revises the Reigns to a Bible. So there's a great mixture of the um, Reigns New Testament in the KJV and in the KJV in the Reigns Due Shalona. Now let me give you an example of this. If you've got your KJV, open up to Hebrews 1 again. Those first few verses there. You understand how this, okay, this interaction that we have up here. Very strange twist of events. How one influenced the other, and then that one, in return, influenced the first one. Now, I'm going to read these first three or four verses from Hebrews 1 out of the 1749-1750 Reigns du Shalona. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in times past of the fathers by the prophets, Last of all in these days has spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. Who being the brightness of his glory and the figure of his substance, and upholding all things by the word of his power, making purgation of sins, uh oh, they kept that present tense though, sitteth on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath inherited a more excellent name than they. And where do you think he got such a translation? Surely two people don't think of the same thing. Surely Chelona has been profoundly influenced as a young boy being raised in a Presbyterian Protestant home by the KJV Bible, the King James Version. That reads exactly like what you have in your King James Bible. Where did he get this? Well, they certainly couldn't have got it from the other. It has to be the reverse. He has to have been influenced earlier in his life because you've got the New Testament done back here. You've got the KJV here. Now, in the Rage New Testament, they don't have it translated like that. We've read that to you before. I think I gave that to you two weeks ago. And so we have to go into the second step of this strange twist of events and interlinking between uh, these two versions. And we see that surely uh, Chaloner and the, the RDC Bible is dependent upon the King James Bible. Now, a lot of Protestants and Catholics don't know that, that they have more similarities in their past than they realize. Because just for years and years, the RD or the RDC Bible was the Bible and the only Bible, in English anyway, uh, for Roman Catholics. And of course, for an equal number of years, 
the KJV was the only Bible for Protestants. And most of the people in the Catholic Church, the lay people, probably including the priest, and most of the people in the Protestant churches, including the pastors, probably didn't know how interrelated their important Bible translations really were. As you go through the RNT to the KJV, from the KJV to the RDC, and you have much uh, twisting of the intertwining of events and translation. Uh, now, with Chaloner, most of the severely polemical notes are deleted. Knox said uh, several decades ago, the glory has departed. Now, Knox was a Roman Catholic scholar who also did a New Testament. We'll study Knox's New Testament also. But the way he described Chaloner's work in his, in his book entitled The Englishing of the Bible was the glory has departed. Because all those polemical notes are gone. The chief of those being what? Well, the chapter heading, the page heading for Acts chapter 8. Simon Magus, more religious than the Protestants. You remember that? Well, they deleted all of that. Why will times have changed? But the fierce animosity of the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation years, that has subsided now. There's some, well, more agreement now, I guess we could say, between the Roman Catholics and Protestants. So there's not so much a need anymore for those strongly, severely polemical nets. So those have changed, and Knox said the glory has departed. It was authorized, the RDC, I just abbreviated as that, Rames de H. Chalone, the RDC. It was authorized for use in America for English-speaking Roman Catholics in 1810. Authorized by Rome for the use in America. United States by English-speaking Roman Catholics in 1810. Now we might then think, well, I wonder if this was the first Roman Catholic Bible published in America then, the RDC, somewhere like 1811, since it just has been recently authorized for their use. No, the first Roman Catholic Bible published in America came 20 years earlier, in 1790. We have a quarto edition of the Douay Old Testament with a little bit of input from Chalonger's work, but it's not officially the RDC Bible. The first Roman Catholic Bible published on the soil of the United States of America was published in 1790, a quarto edition of the Douay Old Testament with some input from Chalonger's work. In other words, it didn't have the new, it was just the Old Testament. With some input of Chalonger's 1750 revision of the Old Testament. Now, does that satisfy everyone about Rames Douay Bible? That's all I'm going to say about Rames Douay. No questions about anything there? You understand all of its history and how it works and strengths and weaknesses and all of this? Notice that in um, what I read from Chalona's revision, that he keeps the making purgation of sins present tense there. We discussed the Latin's problem because it doesn't have the type of participle we need there, and so forth. We discussed that a few weeks ago. Well, here's what I want to conclude with this morning, then. A brief mention of several other English Roman Catholic Bibles. Several other... English Roman Catholic Bibles that never gain the importance of the monumental ones. So these are ones that maybe even if you are a former Catholic, you may never have heard of. There are four other important Roman Catholic Bibles translated this century that we're going to study in chronological order. We've got to get through the KJV all the way up into this century before we discuss those. Four other important Roman Catholic translations in English. Do you know what those are? What are the four important English Roman Catholic translations of the Bible of this century? Jerusalem, Jerusalem is one. American. New American is the other. And I told you the two others this morning. Confraternity and Knox's. Knox's New Testament, Confraternity's New Testament. Jerusalem and the New American Bible are old and new, are complete. Those are the four very important Catholic translations done for English-speaking Roman Catholics during this century. Confraternity, Knox, the New American Bible, and the Jerusalem Bible. We will look at those in much detail, but not now. 
So we're going to finish studying Roman Catholic Bibles right now, even at the end of the 20th century, where we're going to look at what I might call the relatively obscure ones. These are not ones that Roman Catholics were prone to use, but they were works that were translated by Roman Catholic scholars. <coughs> Three in number. And I'll give you the, the names of the people that did the work. First of all, Alexander Geddes, who was a famous Roman Catholic scholar. G-E-double-D-E-S. Alexander Geddes spent most of his life on Old Testament translation. His first volume came out in 1792, which was the Pentateuch. And when, by the way, let, let me say something about these, these three works I'm going to give you. Uh, but they were private ventures, not uh, sponsored by you know, the Roman Catholic Church, or generally it's not the whole church, it's you know, a, di a local diocese or something that sponsors a new translation. These were private ventures by Roman Catholic scholars who went back to the Hebrew and Greek manuscripts for their translation. Maybe I, need to, I do need to say that to begin with, really. So the, these works are not translated from the Latin Vulgate. These scholars, and this is remarkable that Geddes did this so many hundreds of years ago, 200 years ago, went back to Hebrew and or Greek, depending if it's old or new or old and new, text to give us their English translation. So, Alexander Geddes, Old Testament Roman Catholic scholar, first volume of his work published in 1792 of the Pentateuch, the second volume published in 1797, of Judges through Second Chronicles. And he stuck on to that the prayer of Manasseh as well. So this is kind of um, a piecemeal type work. He doesn't do all of the Old Testament. Skipped Joshua there and notice. The Pentateuch and Judges to Second Chronicles. His third volume came out in 1800. This contained, this was not a translation, but it contained his critical remarks on the Pentateuch. So it's part of his work, but it didn't contain any new translation, just the critical apparatus for the Pentateuch. And then a fourth volume was published posthumously in 1807. A fourth volume published posthumously in 1807 of the Psalter, which went from Psalm 1 to Psalm 118. And that's all that he did. Now, what's the title of the work? <laughs> well, his work has a title of 39 words, so I don't think I'll give you that. We'll just call it Gettys Bible. A title had 39 words in it. Now, you see, you probably never used or heard of that Bible, so there's no sense in discussing works like that. We're only discussing important translations. Uh, now, we, of course, we've begun looking at important Roman Catholic translations, and we're really only doing one, the Reigns Douay or the Reigns Douay Chalonor. It's the only important one. And it's going to last for hundreds of years until the 20th century. And then you have Confraternity, then Knox, then New American, then Jerusalem. And we'll discuss those when we get to 20th century translations. A second relatively obscure work was done by F.A. Spencer. F.A. Spencer. Published in 1898. It was entitled The Four Gospels. It was a new translation from the Greek with help from the Vulgate and the Syriac. A new translation from the Greek with help from the Vulgate and the Syriac. And then the whole New Testament appeared posthumously in 1937. So he just gave us the Gospels when he's alive, and posthumously, his entire work is published in 1937. But again, that's not a Bible that Catholics use. A private venture, not a 
venture sponsored by Catholic Diocese or the Vatican. And then thirdly, this is our third and final, the private ventures done by Roman Catholic scholars, was a work done by J.L. Lilly and J.A. Kleist. K-L-E-I-S-T. K-L-E-I-S-T. J.L. Lilly, J.A. Kleist. It was entitled The New Testament from the original Greek with explanatory notes. The New Testament from the original Greek with explanatory notes. Mm -hmm. Published in 1954 in Milwaukee, the beer city. 1954 in Milwaukee. I can't think that Milwaukee is known for much, but for old Milwaukee. <laughs> now, just a few comments here in conclusion about Roman Catholic translations. In principle, is Rome for or against vernacular translations? Against vernacular translations. Adamantly against vernacular translations. Why is she against it? Well, because her sheep are dumb. Really, they're smart, but the Catholics think that they're done and they're going to open their Bible and read things and end up with diverse doctrine that's contrary to the Roman Catholic position. So why do they give translations? To help counter the work of the English Protestant translations. Counter-Reformation translation is what this story is all about. Now, the Rains New Testament comes out in 1582. Just about a hundred years earlier, in 1479, at Cologne, the first two books ever printed to bear the imprimatur came out, and one of these was a Latin Bible. the imprimatur is. I'm sure we can find one in here. The Neil Obstat. Yeah, you'll have a little, like this was Francis Cardinal Spellman, Archbishop of New York. You know who Spellman was. You find it right here. You find this in any work that's approved by the Roman Catholic Church. It has to have its Neil Obstat or its imprimatur. So the first time, if you've ever wondered of the history, and I'm not giving you too much of the history, I'm tying it into our Bible here that we're studying, but the history of the imprimatur which is the stamp they put on the inside of the front page for books approved by the Roman Catholic hierarchy. The first time it ever appeared was in Cologne in 1479 on a Latin Bible. And now in 1582, we have our first English Bible bearing the imprimatur, which would be the Rames New Testament. The first English Bible to bear the imprimatur. Well, I'm going to throw a little early this morning for that then. The Rains do a Shalomer Bible. Those other works, you don't need to remember anything about them. The Geddes and the Lily, you don't need to remember anything about that because you'll never come across that again, probably. If you do, it'll be rare. We get up into the 20th century and we start studying confraternity and then Knox and then even much more important we study the Jerusalem Bible and the New American Bible, those will be some things to remember. The New American Bible happens to be a, a fairly reliable translation. And by the way, the Roman Catholic scholars in America today have um, set to work on a new translation of the New Testament anyway. They just, just um, released some news about that just a few weeks ago, as a matter of fact. So we're probably studying it just about on time to know something about the history of Roman Catholic English translations of the Bible. What's come out thus far doesn't appear to be that good, as far as I'm concerned, in the translation worked up. 